Victory Summary. Uh, we've covered an awful lot of stuff. Um, we talked about helium-4 as a product. We talked about trying to correlate in excess power. We talked about trying to figure out what the Q value is for the reaction. And we found that uh, if you scrub the helium out, the two measurements that have been done that do that will seem to give numbers near 24 MeV. 24 MeV is important because it's the mass difference between two deuterons and helium-4. Um, and if you're getting helium-4, nuclear physicists look at it and think of it as being an alpha particle, especially if it's got some energy. So the question is, how much energy? And we propose to use palladium deuteride and D2L itself as nuclear detectors to answer that question. And from the upper limit from neutron emission, we found that there's not very many neutrons, which is consistent with the alpha particle being born with, uh, you know, on the order of 10 keV or less, it's an upper limit, but it's consistent with it being born stationary. Uh, then if, the, usually in a nuclear uh, reaction, the energy is expressed in terms of energetic particles and radiation. That's not happening here. So the question is, where does the energy go? And um, we don't know where the energy goes from an experiment. The best we've managed to do so far is to infer from the two laser experiment the lattice, that the nuclear energy is going into lattice vibrations. Um, we began sorting out uh, theoretical issues. And if you, if you think about it, to some degree, a down conversion of a very large nuclear quantum would actually start to make sense to <coughs> all of this. Uh, the only issue is, is that such a substantial down conversion is not known in the previous literature. Most folks would bet against it. On the other hand, in the field of high harmonic generation, there's evidence for um, multi-quantum addition of on the order a little bit less than 10,000 uh, optical quanta into x-rays. Um, we found, we, we looked at the spin boson model and we found that the spin boson model has coherent energy conversion under conditions where many quanta are exchanged for one two level, many oscillator quanta exchange for one two level excitation. The, um, the effect is there, but it's too weak to do what we need. So then we said, well, what, what's the reason? What limits it? Why can't we do better? And we found that the model doesn't do better because of destructive interference inside the model. Uh, that destructive interference can be eliminated um, with loss processes. And the loss processes that are under discussion, if one thinks about it in the physical system, there's plenty of loss processes that we do to John. So um, we end up now with a, with a mathematical model, a toy mathematical model that's actually strong enough to take a big quantum and chop it up sufficiently now to be able to do what's needed. So we, we have sort of an existence proof that a model exists that, uh, that can actually do what, what needs to be done. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't. You know, as a, as a mathematical model, we, we don't yet, we haven't yet described the connection of the physical model. The physical models, there's lots of physics and there's mathematics associated with physics, but we've been dealing with the toy model, we've not been dealing with the industrial strength model. Okay, so I, I talked about this uh, tutorial on how Huntings last time, and the other was probably a it's, it's worthwhile to review this once again, if you'll, if you'll forgive me. Um, the, the basic idea is that when we talk about these models, we talk about them in terms of Hamiltonians. Uh, but not everybody knows what Hamiltonian is. So the place to start is if we have Newton's laws. If, if a position advances a kind of velocity and a momentum, change in momentum is uh, related to the force, then constant potential we get energy. So energy is kinetic energy, potential energy. And what uh, Hamilton did is he said that um, if you construct this uh, object, which has got the kinetic energy and potential energy in it, then once you have that, you can actually recover your dynamical equ 
equations from that. So this is all that you need. You, you don't actually need to remember uh, Newton's laws. Uh, and the reason that's important today is because we're going to be, I'm going to have Hamiltonians on the board. And what you need to know is that uh, there are techniques and methods to analyze a problem once you know the Hamiltonian. The thing that's important is what's in the Hamiltonian, because what's in the Hamiltonian tells you what's in the model. So, for example, if you have kinetic energy and potential energy, you can describe all kinds of things. So, um, if I have kinetic energy and I have a potential energy that's a Coulomb potential, then this model's enough to give me Newton's laws that describes an electron going around with a proton or a deuteron. So I get a classical model for a hydrogen atom. But if you like, that model came from having kinetic energy and potential energy. Um, now in the quantum case, the same kind of things apply. In the quantum case, you might have a quantum model that will have kinetic energy and potential energy. And if you like to go from the Hamiltonian now down to the solution, it involves a little bit different mathematics. You've got to solve the Schrodinger equation. But methods to do that are known, and you get wave functions, energy levels, hydrogen atoms, and that kind of thing. So the focus in this discussion then should be on the Hamiltonian. And as long as we can understand that we've got to keep track of the Hamiltonians and pay attention to what's in the Hamiltonians, then we'll be okay. Um, so last time we talked a little bit about the spin boson model. And I had mentioned that the spin boson model is sort of one of the best studied models in the physics literature. And it's a great model. Um, the reason it's interesting here is that it abstracts um, the essential um, dynamics and behavior of much more complicated systems. For example, if you have an atom or molecule or nucleus, it's got all kinds of levels and dynamics are really complicated. But if you just focus on what two levels are doing and the interactions there, the associated math is much simpler. Alternatively, um, vibrational systems can be unbelievably quant uh, complicated, quantum and modes and nonlinearities and so forth. But if we take just a simple mass and spring as, a, as an oscillator, then that's very fundamental and it's easier to analyze mathematically. And then if these two guys, there's coupling, they talk to one another, then we can start to model energy exchange between this system and this system. Not only model energy exchange, but we can begin to model energy exchange under conditions where this energy is small compared to this energy. If I want, if you like, this is going to stand in for the nuclear system, so I'm going to have a big energy quantum, and this is going to stand in for vibrations, so these are going to be small quanta. Um, the Hamiltonian in this case looks something like this. There's three terms in the spin boson model. This part's got the energy of the two level systems. This part's got the mass and spring in the oscillator. And this gives linear coupling between them. So if you like, we've got a Hamiltonian. We put into the Hamiltonian everything that we wanted to have be in the Hamiltonian. That's just a question now of turning the crank to get some answers. Given the Hamiltonian, as we described last time, and what we could do is we could just solve it by brute force. We start the two level systems in the upper state, start the oscillator a little with a fair amount of energy, but sort of relatively unexcited. We can calculate that the energy is going back and forth from the two level system to the oscillator. But in this case, there's 17 oscillator quanta produced for every two level transition. So it's in the multi quantum regime. So We've got coherent energy exchange. The time scale is really very slow on a scale for how the oscillator vibrates. But this is just a straightforward mathematical, actually brute force numerical solution of the spin boson model. And it's showing qualitatively exactly what we're looking for. How does it work? Well, we discussed this last time. We exchange one quantum at a time. And you can end up exchanging 17 quanta one at a time as long as you maintain Um, we discussed why it runs out of steam. It runs out of steam because of destructive interference. If we add loss, so we have the same Hamiltonian, now we add 
loss. This guy is modeling loss. This is sort of a general way in an infinite order of Wilhelm Wigner root to formalism to add loss to an otherwise uh, loss free Hamiltonian. When we do that, um, turns out the destructive interference is broken. If I do perturbation theory, if I go from one state to another state where it converts and plots it to a two-level system, if there's no loss, then all the different pathways add up and you get destructive interference. But if you have loss, then some of these guys can behave differently. They see loss differently than those guys, and that breaks the destructive interference. The way to think about it, I guess this is complicated, maybe it's not. This is the energy that you start with or the system's got available. These states down here have two level systems that are de-excited. So these states are lower in energy. And what that means is if you've got a loss process, then if you give up energy, then these states can be very happy being final states of some decay process. Whereas these guys have more energy than the system has. So as such, you can't have a loss process that easily you can't easily have a loss process that ends up putting you in that state uh, at the end. So as a result, these states uh, can have fast loss rates. Those guys probably aren't going to have fast loss rates. And the difference between going this way and going that way is what breaks the destructive interference, which is what it is that makes this thing work. So I very briefly talked last time that given the model, there's techniques to turn the crank and grind out a solution. Um, we, we got this model, we, we found this model somewhere between 2001 and 2002. We had a lot of time to turn the crank. A few years ago, we published all the details. So the crank turning's out there published. Um, the way it works, I mean, funny equations, but this equation for an oscillator is sort of like a pendulum swinging back and forth. Um, on the other hand, it's a nonlinear pendulum. So it's a pendulum that takes forever to go this way and then goes very fast and goes this way slowly and then goes very fast. And, and here's the rate that you come, you get at the end of the day. And the rate turns out sort of to be interesting. Uh, the four and this term right here is what you would get if the oscillator and the two-level system energy were perfectly matched. Then this, 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 this would give you the rate at which things would go in the free string and limit. Now, if the coupling is really strong and you fractionate, you have, say, 51 or 101, a million of one oscillator quantum you fractionated into, then you get a penalty of 1 over the number of quanta that you've fractionated. And if you like, you look at that and you say, well, yeah, that makes the rate slower. That's true. But it's not. It's not tremendously, horribly slower. This is sort of a gentle scaling for fractionation. And this, this is absolutely stunning. And this guy right here is a hindrance factor. And basically says, if you want to make this magic work, the coupling's got to be strong. And coupling's got to be strong sort of based on these variables. And um, so here's the hindrance factor. Basically it says, when the parameter is too small, you pay orders and orders of magnitude, the energy doesn't go. <coughs> If the coupling is strong enough, then the hindrance factor goes up to 1, and you go sort of to the free streaming limit, and the energy goes back and forth. So that's what the model does. And what it says is that if you can arrange for the coupling to be strong, you're good. You can take the big quantum, you can fractionate it. Um, and I think I'm, I discussed that. There's one other issue associated with this which is worth discussing. Um, in the spin boson model, there's some intuition that goes along with it. And the intuition is that if you got your, your oscillator oscillating and your two little systems talking the oscillator, in the spin boson model, it's almost as if each two level system independently sees the oscillator and responds to the oscillator. There's sort of, there's no coherence, there's no not horrible nonlinearities to lowest order. There's, there's not much happen. It's, it's almost as if you've got electromagnetic field coming by. You've got atoms responding to electromagnetic field. Each atom responds independently of what all the other ones are doing. That's, what's, that's sort of the 
intuition that goes with the spin boson model. And that's the intuition that goes along with the coupling strength here. Um, for the, when you add loss, um, the dimensionless coupling strength that's relevant is this one. And this is very different. And what it says is the coupling strength for this model in presence of loss starts out with the spin boson coupling strength. So the picture we start out with is good. But then we multiply it by essentially the number of atoms you got or nuclei or molecules. So now, uh, when loss is present, it turns out that, that this atom, to decide whether loss is present, has to know what this atom state is and what this atom state is. So there's built into this a, a way that indirectly these guys talk to one another. So as a result, the system doesn't respond in a way that every atom is independent of every other atom. This time now, the response is all of the atoms. The system recognizes all of the atoms are there. And the energy transfer depends on all the atoms being there. So, you know, for example, uh, if the coupling for one nucleus with the vibrations is really, really weak, well, all you got to do is put a 10 to the 10th of them. And what is a really weak coupling is how much stronger coupling. And that's what this model does. But this model doesn't. The normal spin goes on model without loss. If the coupling with one nucleus is weak, you put in 10 to the 10th. You have to change the situation of all the couplings still weak for all of them. Whereas in the lossy case, the coupling increases with the number. And if you like this, this is the thing that's so non-intuitive. makes this such a, such a vastly different problem. Takeaway message. Well, there's a takeaway message. I've just outlined a mathematical model <coughs> that's capable of taking a big quantum and chopping it up into lots of small quanta and getting all the things to do. Um, okay, takeaway message. You know the drill. Questions, comments, thoughts. <coughs>